I've got it. All right. So like I said, my name is Becky Gates. I'm the education manager here at Audubon's Rose Sanctuary. We are a nature sanctuary situated right along the Platte River. And it was started back in 1974 for the purpose of protecting the river habitat for the migrating sandhill cranes. So this is a program that we would typically do every day during what we call our crane season, which would run from the beginning of March to about mid-April. Um, unfortunately, we had to close down only about a week and a half into our crane season. So we did not get to do most of our programs this year for crane season. So unfortunately, that means that we are adapting and we are trying to get the information out there in other ways, such as this webinar. So we're gonna talk about the sandhill cranes, some basic information about them, some behaviors that you would see from the cranes, especially here, and then a little bit more about the Platte River and the work that we do here at Rose Sanctuary. All right. So here in North America, we have two species of cranes. We have the sandhill crane and the whooping crane. The sandhill crane is the biggest has the biggest numbers of any crane in the world. So they are the most populous crane and the whooping crane is the most endangered species of crane in the world. So it has the smallest numbers of cranes. So it's pretty interesting to see that we kind of have both ends of the spectrum. We've got the biggest and the smallest population wise of species of cranes. This photograph here is kind of a good way to see that. You can see all of the sandhill cranes in the photograph and then down there at the bottom there is one lone whooping crane in the photo. So that's kind of like what it is out there in the wild. There's a bunch of sandhill cranes, but not a ton of whooping cranes. So people often ask, why Nebraska? Why are there so many cranes here along the Platte River? Well, sandhill cranes stage here in Nebraska. So staging means they're stopping and staying for an extended period of time, putting on extra body weight. So each individual crane is here about three to four weeks. So the first cranes will come in about mid-February and we keep getting more and more and more until about mid to late March. And then they start kind of leaving mid to late March and then the last ones leave about mid-April. So it's kind of like a bell curve. So we kind of get numbers, we reach a peak and then we lose numbers. Typically, that's how it goes each year. So the cranes we see here are actually one population of sandhill cranes. There are different populations across North America. 80% of all sandhill cranes are actually in this population and migrate through Nebraska to their nesting grounds. So they are this kind of gray population on the map. So you can see their wintering grounds are down south in Texas, Mexico, New Mexico area. And they're staging here in Nebraska in that nice little gray circle there. And then they're going to their nesting grounds up north in Canada, Alaska, and even into Siberia. So they have quite a ways to go, which is another reason why they're staying here so long. They want to put on that extra body weight to really help them finish the migration. They still got a ways to go. And sometimes when you get up to Alaska, even in May, it still might have snow on the ground. So they want to make sure they've got some extra fat reserves in case they can't find food right away. So the other 20% of sandhill cranes are spread out between these other populations that are colored on the map. So most of their day is spent eating out in the cornfields here along the Platte River. Uh, like I said, they're putting on body weight, so they're spending a lot of time eating. They are eating a lot of waste grain in the fields right now. Uh, they estimate about 80 to 90 percent of their diet is made out of waste grain in the fields, but they also are omnivores, so they're eating things like bugs and worms, and they'll even eat snakes or mice pretty much anything they can pick up and swallow whole, they're gonna eat. So they're not picky eaters at all. They uh, will even be found in fields where cattle have been grazing because they will pick through the cow pies looking for food to eat, any bugs that are in there or undigested grains or things like that. So they really are not picky eaters if they're willing to pick through cow pies. Uh, cranes have been coming through the Platte River for thousands if not millions of years. So before there were cornfields around here, there was a bunch of native grasslands and wet meadows that they would have found food in. So lots of grains and stuff from the grasses or tubers that they would dig up underground with their feet. They would also, you know, eat snails and other things like that as well. So they, just because they eat a lot of corn now doesn't mean that they have always eaten corn. 
you will often see them flying kind of in small family groups when you're, they're going from like field to field. So you will see them at least in pairs typically. They do keep the same mate year after year, so they do mate for life. So they often will be traveling around with that mate. You might see them traveling with an offspring or two as well. That's pretty typical for them to be traveling with, especially last year's offspring. Uh, the offspring, we call them colts. They stay with mom and dad for a full year. So they travel south with mom and dad in the fall and then back north with them in the springtime. Occasionally an unmated offspring from a year or two ago will join up with mom and dad and travel with them as well. So that's pretty typical to see. There are a couple of ways to tell a juvenile colt from an adult crane. The biggest one is actually by their voice. So juvenile cranes actually have not, haven't gone through their voice change yet. So I do have some sound clips for you guys. I'm gonna make sure that this, you're sharing computer sound. So the first one is what one single adult crane sounds like. Now we don't typically hear just one crane because there's tens of not hundreds of thousands of them here, but it gives you a good idea of what one crane does sound like by itself. Right, so that was the adult, that's what they sound like. A, a call from a crane can be heard from over a mile away, maybe even up to two miles away. So oftentimes you can hear them before you see them. So it's very, very cool to hear them sometimes flying over and they're too high for you to even see. In contrast, this is what the juvenile crane sounds like. It's just kind of a high squeaky note. I'm gonna play it one more time for you guys. Maybe. There's that nice little squeak voice. So it's very, very different from the, the adults. So this third clip is what it sounds like out here where you hear lots of adults and then a few juveniles kind of piping up in between them. So I want you to see if you can hear the juveniles speaking up. Nope. I hope you guys can kind of hear those juveniles piping up in there amongst all of those adult cranes. Sandhill cranes are a fairly tall bird. They range in height between three and four feet tall. There is a little bit of a difference in height because there are different subspecies of sandhill crane. The two biggest ones are lesser sandhill cranes and greater sandhill cranes. We have mostly lesser sandhill cranes that come through here, so they're closer to that three feet tall. And then the graders, we have a few mixed in, so they're going to be a little closer to four feet tall. They do intermix, they do interbreed, so you do get intermediate sized cranes as well. And you notice when they're walking around, it looks like their tail is much longer than it actually is. That is actually because when they fold their wings into their body, a few of their tail feathers fold over their tail there in the back. And that is what we call their bustle, those little feathers in the back. They do use their bustle for communication, so keep that in mind. You might hear it later when we talk about some of their behaviors. Cranes, like all birds, have what appears to be a backwards knee that is actually a modified heel or ankle bone. So birds walk just on their toes, and the rest of that's technically their foot up to the ankle. They do have a knee, it's just kind of tucked up underneath their belly, and they don't really use it much for movement. Birds' toes tell us a lot about their lifestyle. For instance, cranes have a very, very short back toe, and that tells us they can't perch in a tree because you would need a long back toe to grip onto a branch so you don't fall out of a tree. So they have to do everything on the ground. So that means they're eating, they're sleeping, and they're nesting on the ground. So that comes into play a little bit later as to why they are roosting in the river. So we'll talk about why the Platte River a little bit later. Cranes have that nice big bright red crown on top of their head. That is actually a bald spot. So what you're seeing is actually their skin and then it's highly vas vascularized. So you are seeing blood vessels just underneath the skin that give it that bright red coloration. They actually use their crown as a communi communication tool amongst other cranes. So when they are kind of happy and everything is fine, the, cr the crown's gonna look a little bit smaller, a little bit more dull red, kind of like the cranes over here on the left, a little bit smaller, a little bit more dull. 
when they're in, in an excited state, so it could be they're agitated at another crane, there's a change that happens in their body that causes the blood flow to go uh, up to their crown and make it look brighter red. So these cranes kind of over here on the right, you can see their crowns are a little bit bigger and a little bit more bright red. So that's to let the other cranes know that they're feeling a little bit agitated with each other. Cranes have those nice, beautiful gray feathers, but on occasion you might see some kind of rusty reddish brown feathers mixed in. That is actually due to a behavior they do where they actually will paint their feathers with mud. They do that a lot in their nesting grounds to help them camouflage a little bit better since they're nesting on the ground. And the soil up there will stain their feathers that brown color. Cranes go through a continuous molt, so they just lose a few feathers here and there throughout the year. They do not lose them all at once. So those brown feathers are actually left over from last summer, and they just haven't lost those and replaced them just yet. They do often paint their feathers other times of the year too, like they might even do that here. Sometimes that is to get rid of any like bugs or parasites on their skin or feathers, but the soil here and down south do not stain their feathers that brown coloration. So it's more of a temporary discoloration when they do that other places. So now we're kind of getting into some behaviors that the cranes will do. So you can kind of tell what the cranes are thinking and feeling by looking for these behaviors. Uh, this first one is called the wing spread display. So you can see the crane there in the middle. He's got his wings kind of spread wide open. What he's doing is, is he's signaling to the other cranes that he's feeling a little crowded. So he's trying to make himself look a little bit bigger. So the other cranes will kind of give him a little bit more space. This is also a common posture they will take if there's a predator, especially a predator threatening their offspring. They'll kind of make themselves look bigger to hopefully chase the predator away as well. So that's a pretty common thing to see them kind of spreading out. You know, they just need a little bit more elbow room from the other cranes. You can kind of see the cranes over here to the left are taking the posture of our next behavior. They're kind of stretching their neck out. That is actually a crane's pre-flight behavior. So before a crane is ready to leave and go to a new spot, they're going to stretch their neck out so it almost looks horizontal to the ground, and then they're going to take off together. So what they're doing is, is they are signaling to their family group that they want to leave. They want to go to a new spot. Oftentimes, if one crane takes that posture, other cranes around them will start to take that same posture. So they, they know that they're all ready to leave together so no one gets left behind. Because cranes are fairly vocal, they are doing a vocalization as well with this. It's just kind of a low purring type of noise. So it's hard for us to pick up, especially from far away. So they are talking to each other as well. It's not just the posture, but it's really fun because if you see that posture, you can tell someone, hey, watch those cranes, they're gonna take off soon. And then you would be right. So you, would, you know your stuff. The next behavior we're gonna look at is their dancing. Uh, cranes are notorious for dancing. All species of cranes dance, and cranes actually do dance year-round. It is not strictly a courtship behavior like it is for some other birds. So cranes have a series of movements they like to do with their dancing. There's usually jumping involved. There's usually bowing or curtsying back and forth to each other. Sometimes they even touch beaks together, kind of looking like a crane kiss. Obviously, they're not really kissing, but it kind of looks like that to us. Uh, sometimes they also will throw things in the air and stuff like that as well as part of the dancing. So I do have some video clips of that dancing because obviously everyone loves to watch dancing. But it's really fun to watch because mated cranes that have been together for several years tend to dance more in sync with one another. So they kind of know their, their own routine. They tend to bow at the same time and jump at the same time and things like that. So they kind of have a, a dance routine all set if they've been together year after year. Uh, whereas newly mated cranes or cranes that are dancing to hopefully find a mate tend not to be quite as in sync with one another. Dancing is also a social behavior for cranes. It's not just something they do with their mate or potential mate. They will also dance in groups as well. So sometimes one crane might get in the mood to dance and then a whole bunch of cranes join. Uh, this guy here, he's obviously in the mood to dance, trying to get someone to join. No one seems particularly interested in joining him to dance, which does happen on occasion. Either he just wants to dance and have fun, or he is trying to, he's an unmated crane trying to find a mate. We're not 100% sure, but that does happen on occasion as well. Dancing is not just for the river, it's also for the cornfields. And in the cornfields, there's lots of fun things to throw. So they're throwing corn cobs and sticks and all sorts of stuff out there in the cornfields. So that's pretty fun to watch as well. 
All right, this next behavior is actually a vocalization that the cranes will do called a unison call. So this is something mated cranes do together and it's kind of their way of signaling to other cranes that this is their territory. They're kind of claiming territory or space from other cranes around them. And this is the one time you can actually tell the difference between a male and a female crane. Externally, they look identical. So the male, he's gonna stick his head almost straight up in the air when he does his call. And the female's only gonna tilt her head at like 45 degrees when she does her call. So this, there's gonna be a couple video clips. The first one, so you can just kind of hear what it sounds like by itself. This is just one pair of cranes down in Florida. So they're kind of isolated. So you can actually hear what it sounds like. And then we've got some, here out along the river as well. So you can see the males on the left, females on the right. So again, here we see that on the river, these, this pair is trying to kind of claim territory along the river. Obviously this crane didn't get the memo and he's still bothering them and trying to kind of chase them away from where they are. And then it happened again, so there'll be another video clip of them unison calling. The male, I think is still the middle left yet. So there's the male, there's the female. And this guy came over again, and this time the male kind of chased him away, kind of learned his lesson at the time. So that's the only time you can really tell a male from a female. Now we're going to be looking at some threats that they will do. This first one's called a bow threat. So we see the unison calling happening. And then watch this guy right here on the left. He's going to put his head down into a bow. What he's doing is, is he's showing off his big bright red crown to the other crane showing how agitated he is. So remember earlier I said the crown is used as like a facial expression? That's what he's doing, is he's showing how annoyed he is by showing his crown over time. You, just so you can see him do it again. That's where that crown really comes into play, is showing how agitated he is. Now sometimes bowing doesn't work, so there is another threat that they will do. We call this one the ruffle threat, and this utilizes that bustle there in the back. So watch the bustle start to kind of ruffle and their wings start to ruffle. And sometimes they bow as well at the end of the ruffle threat. This is kind of the next step up after the bow threat. So this is basically saying, hey man, you're in my space. I need you to back up. You know, you're really starting to annoy me. You're just in the way. I need you to get out of here. We see this a lot out there on the river. They're pretty crowded out there on the sandbar. So they do feel a little bit close to each other. And sometimes you might see one crane do it, and then another crane might start to feel a little too clustered together. Then another one might do it, and someone else might do it. So it's kind of fun to watch them ruffle those bustles, threatening each other. Now, sometimes those two threats do not work. So they will resort to more aggressive behaviors, some aggressive contests. These are usually short little things that happen. They do not want to draw out any sort of aggressive behaviors or fights because one, it wastes energy, which is not the goal of being here along the Platte River. They want to gain energy, but also you can get injured. And an injury here could mean that they don't finish their migration or they don't get to the nesting grounds in time to have a successful nesting season. So some things you might see when they're being aggressive with each other is something called bill sparring, which is that top left photo, where they kind of hit bills together, maybe try to grab each other's bill, kind of like a little sword fight with their bills. Um, they might just chase the other one away by putting their head down and kind of chasing them with their beak. Sometimes there's jump contests, and then the most serious one is down at the bottom right. We call it a jump rake, where they actually will jump up and then kick their feet out towards the other crane and actually kind of try to scratch the, the belly of the other crane. So we do have a video of, of some of these contests. It is slowed down so you can see it a little bit easier. So we're watching these kind of cranes right here in the middle. You kind of see they're having a little bit of a disagreement. They're kind of talking to each other. And there's some a little bit of bill sparring happening. And the one on the left is gonna start to chase the other one, try to get him away. And here's some more bill sparring gonna happen here. Not chasing them. And then this other crane's gonna get on it and start to jump at him. And you can see there's a jump rake where they jumped up and kind of raked their feet at each other. So if this was full speed, this would only be a few seconds. Like I said, it's not very long. Usually it's just these short little spats out there um, over space typically. So after the cranes have been here about three to four weeks each, they are gonna leave us 
And usually the last cranes leave right around April 15th, right around the middle of April. Sometimes it's earlier, sometimes it's later. It's very weather dependent on when they decide to move. But they will get to their nesting grounds usually sometime in May. And a lot of times, like I said, it looks like this up there, kind of snow covered. But these cranes are happy they're dancing in the snow. Cranes will then have a territory that they will defend. They will often keep a territory of about a mile radius free from other pairs of cranes. And then they will nest. And after about a month of incubation, the, the chicks or the colts hatch. So it, it's about a month incubation time. And because they are on the ground, the colts do have to be ready to follow their mom and dad around within a few hours. So they're able to walk very, very quickly. They just start walking around, follow mom and dad as soon as they can. And they also learn all of these behaviors we've talked about from their parents. So they are walking around eating and taking lessons such as dance lessons. So here is a colt that's about two and a half weeks old. So you can already see it's quite a bit bigger than that first photo. They do have a very quick growth rate. Remember summertime in Alaska is particularly short. So they do have to grow pretty quickly in order to be able to migrate south in the fall. See this colt here, it says it's two months old, six to two days, and it's already the same size as mom and dad. Right around two months is when they fledge, when they're able to fly as well. So it's a very, very fast growth rate. So imagine going from a little itty bitty chick to about three feet tall in just two months. It's pretty fast. They, these videos came from this couple in Alaska who actually charted this couple of cranes that came to their property year after year and their success rate each year. So they had them there for about 20 years, which is pretty close to the lifespan of a crane. Cranes live between 20 and 25 years uh, pretty, pretty consistently. Some have lived longer than that, but, uh, but 20 to 25 is the average lifespan of a crane. And over those 20 years, they had eight successful offspring fledge and travel south with mom and dad that fall. So you can see it's not a real high success rate. That's one reason why St. Hill crane numbers have remained fairly steady because, and they haven't boomed like the snow geese or other birds have. They've just kind of remained per, pretty steady over the years. All right, we are going to head back to the Platte River and talk about the other species of crane real quick. This is the whooping crane. Like I said, it is the most endangered species of crane in the world. Back in the 1940s, there was less than 20 individual whooping cranes left. So scientists intervened and took them into captive breeding programming. And now between the captive population and the wild populations, there's a little over 700 individual whooping cranes now. So obviously still a lot of work to do, still fairly endangered, but quite a bit more than just less than 20 back in the 40s. All right, so this is a map of the two wild populations of whooping cranes and where they migrate through. So you can see there is that one uh, population that does migrate through here. They're going from Texas to Canada for nesting. They will travel through here. There's about 500 individuals in that one population. So it is the bulk of the whooping cranes that we have currently in the world. But they do not stop and stage like the sandhill cranes do. They are only staying each once here, maybe two, three days, and then they move on. So it is a little bit more luck of a draw if you get to see a whooping crane. They are moving through right now. Typically they move through later than the sandhill crane. So they start moving through usually, we see them end of March into the first week or two of April is when we see them. So we have seen some recently coming through here. You can see when whooping cranes are among their sandhill crane cousins, they really do stand out. They, they are close to five feet tall, so they're at least a foot taller than a sandhill crane. You can see they have those nice bright white feathers with those dark black feathers on their wingtips. Their feathers was actually their downfall back in the early 1900s. They were overhunted for their feathers to be used in fashion accessories. But luckily we have been able to do our part and bring their numbers back up so we do see them here. Rose Sanctuary has the highest incidence of whooping crane using our section of river over any other section of river along the Platte. So we're particularly lucky to be able to see them fairly often here. So historically, like I said, cranes have been coming through the Platte River Valley for thousands if not millions of years. And that was mostly due to the, how the Platte River was back, way back when. So when the white settlers were first coming through Nebraska, they used to say that the Platte River was a mile wide and an inch deep. 
which is actually fairly accurate. So each spring, snowmelt from the mountains out west would flood the entire Platte River Valley with water, which choked out any trees or shrubs or plants trying to grow in, in the river valley, which is what kept it that nice, wide, shallow, sandy channel of water. Unfortunately, you know, as people came, as white people came through, we changed the river. We dammed it, pulled water away for irrigation, land development, things like that. So the river in a lot of places looks like this now. So you can see it's heavily forested in a lot of places. There's too many trees along it, which actually forces the river to become more channelized. So there's more, like there's more smaller channels of water as opposed to one big channel of water. And when you force the water through a smaller channel, you're also forcing it to become deeper because the water's pushing all the sand and stuff downstream. So a lot of the river that the cranes would have used is unusable to them now. They cannot use this to, to sleep in. They need about three to six inches of water to stand in, and most of this is just too deep for them now. So when Rose Sanctuary was started in 1974, our mission is to protect the birds and their habitat now and in the future. So some ways we accomplish that is what nature used to do for us, we now have to do manually. So we will manually clear the river channel of plants and trees and stuff using machinery to keep our section of the river wide and shallow as we can. We are converting some cropland back into native grasslands and wet meadows. And with that, we do controlled burns on those areas. A lot of native plants actually have adapted to needing to go through a burn cycle in order to grow properly. The Great Plains would have burned naturally. You know, it gets dry, there's a lightning strike and a fire. So we mimic that by doing this controlled burning to help those plants grow properly. And then we also do cattle grazing on some of those lands as well to help mimic what the bison herds would have done in the area as well, moving through, eating the plants, tilling up the soil, leaving lots of good fertilizer behind in their, in their uh, cow pies as well. So due to all that habitat work, this is what the river channel looks like here at Rose Sanctuary. You can see it's pretty wide and shallow compared to that other photograph of the river. You can also see the sandbars. That's what the cranes are looking for when they're flying through here. They're, like I said, they're looking for about three to six inches of water to stand in, and that helps protect them at night. So that way if a predator like a coyote tries to come out and eat one of them in the middle of the night, they're gonna hear splashing in the water and that'll let them know that someone's coming after them. So that is why they like this uh, area as well. They like this, the management we do here. And that translates to the river looking like this, kind of during peak time of the migration. It almost looks wall-to-wall -wall cranes out there. Rose Sanctuary uh, manages about five miles of the river. And at any particular time, we usually have 80 to 100,000 cranes on our five miles. Last year, the highest count on our five mile stretch was close to 200,000 cranes on our five miles of river. So it's pretty cool that uh, we're able to see kind of all of these efforts really translate into cranes being able to use the river again. All right. So I'm gonna open the chat. If you have any questions that haven't been answered. Um, someone, someone's asking what a common crane is. That's usually also referred to as the Eurasian crane. So sometimes the, there are Eurasian or common cranes over in Siberia as well during nesting season. So sometimes one gets mixed in with the sandhill cranes when they start to migrate south again. So sometimes there is a common crane mixed in. Bosque del Apache is down in New Mexico, which is one of the wintering sites that a lot of sandhill cranes go to. So how many cranes do we estimate are at row right now? So the Crane Trust, which is a different organization, they do a weekly crane count. And the last count was about 475,000 cranes in the Platte River Valley. So they survey about 75 to 80 miles of river. Um, and I think we had over 100,000 on that count on our section. So we had probably close to a quarter of them on our five miles. Can you describe the sentinel behavior, please? So cranes do not sleep the whole night through like we do. They kind of nap intermittently. So there's usually at least one or two cranes in a group awake. So that, that kind of acts as a sentinel for the rest of the group so that if they hear something, they will let each other know. 
That is also why if you get on the crane cam at like three in the morning, you're gonna hear cranes talking because there are cranes awake at that time talking to each other. What? Um, do whooping cranes stage anywhere? Not to my knowledge. I don't believe they do. I think it's just because they eat different things. They are more of a, uh, they eat some more wetland things like crabs and stuff like that. So I believe that they actually leave their wintering grounds with a little bit more energy, but I'm not 100% sure about that. That might be something to look up. Um, can I show the migration map again? Uh, possibly, let me see if I can get there. The, I, do you, I hope you mean the Sandhill map. So what I'm going to show. So this is the the Sandhill map of where they're going and where they came from. Uh, so we man the camera in the early morning, usually like six to eight or nine in the morning and then around seven to nine p.m. Otherwise it's just on autopilot typically. So if you go to explore.org that is where our crane cam is streaming. So you're welcome to go there. It's streaming 24 seven and even all year round. So you can go on there at any point and kind of see what's happening on the river. They So someone asked do they stop back in the fall on their way south? They do not. They actually stage in Canada before they head south. So they've already staged. We will see some flying over and they might stop for a day, but otherwise they're just kind of moving on. Um, besides donation, how else can we best support Rose Sanctuary given the lost revenue due to COVID? Well, we, would, we do appreciate any and all donations that you guys can afford. We know it's a tough time for everyone. We also always rely heavily on volunteers especially during crane season. We see about 25,000 people in about six weeks during crane season. So we could not do that as a staff of six. So if you were in a position where you could take, you know, a week or two and come out and volunteer, that is always an option as well. What signal do the cranes get to cause them to leave the river in the morning or fields in the evening? You know, that's a good question because sometimes we think we know when they're gonna leave and they just don't, they just don't leave when we think. Sometimes they get spooked off the river by like an eagle. So a bunch of them will leave because of that. Otherwise, we just don't know. They just are hungry, so they decide to go to the field. And usually coming back to the river is a little bit more based on when the sun is setting. So that one's a little bit more easy to tell. As soon as it starts getting a little darker, they make their way towards the river. How many eggs are in a clutch? Good question, I didn't say that. They always lay two eggs, but typically only one survives to fledging if one survives. So there's pretty high sibling rivalry between the two colts. And because they are on the ground, they're very susceptible to predators as well. Good question. Can you explain how they keep their feet warm in the water? Very good question. So crane circulation is very different from ours. So they have blood vessels that actually touch in their legs. So the capillaries that are going down to their feet, which have warm blood from the heart, and the veins coming up from their feet, which have the cold blood from their, their toes, actually sit next to each other in their legs. So there's heat transfer. So the blood that's going down isn't losing as much heat when it gets to their feet, and the blood coming up is already pre-warmed. So by the time it gets up to their body, it's not as cold. So they're able to conserve a lot more heat. So they're built much more able to withstand that kind of cold water on their feet than we ever would be. Do the individual cranes winter in the same regions? It's a good question. We assume they do. It's very hard to tell when there's, you know, 600 plus, 600,000 plus cranes. Hard to keep track. They all look very similar. Uh, there was a study done at one point where they did radio tag cranes, and it did seem to be that they took the same migration routes each year because they do learn it from their parents that we assume they're going to the same spots each time. Did the flooding last year alter Rose's section of the plat? Not really. It did make it a little bit easier for us because we didn't have to clear any sandbars of vegetation because the river was flooded all year. Uh, I haven't seen a sandbar in about a year, so obviously there's no plants growing on them. So it helped us a little bit 
by doing some of our conservation work for us, but it, it did ruin the roads a little bit out here, which we didn't appreciate too much. Do they mate while at row or not until they arrive at their summer grounds? They find a mate here if they are looking for one, but they do not technically mate until they get to their nesting grounds up north. Good question. Are the greater sandhill cranes in the Midwest migratory or do they or do they stay in the Midwest? Does the Florida population stay there and migrate? Good questions. So the greater sandhill cranes, yes, are in that eastern population that go from Florida to the Great Lakes area. I believe there are also greater sandhill cranes to the west of us in kind of the rocky mountain population and stuff like that. And Florida actually has both cranes that migrate and cranes that stay there year round. So it's a little confusing. I don't know how they know which ones migrate and which ones don't, but somehow the cranes know if they migrate or if they don't migrate. Thank you so much for saying you donated your tour funds back to us. We appreciate that. Yes, feel free to share the crane cam with anyone. We really do appreciate that. <clears throat> So I am recording this. We will post it somewhere. I'm not entirely sure how it's gonna get posted just yet. Our uh, communications person is going to take care of that. If you have Facebook, follow our Facebook page. It should be posted on there and also check our website as well. So we hopefully will post it up there as well. When and how do you sign up to volunteer? So you can sign up any point. I believe there are, is some information on our website at row.audubon.org. You can also get in touch with our volunteer coordinator. Her name is Wendy. Um, I'm going to type her email down here for you as well. So you can get in touch with her and she can uh, let you know how to, how to get in touch with that. Um, I lost where I was. Yes, good, good point, Cody. Thank you, Cody. Yes, we also have um, an online gift store that we can ship items to you as well. So if you are looking for some cool gifts for people or a souvenir because you didn't get out here, you can order stuff online and we will ship it to you as well. That's a great way to help us as well. The camera is working today. Yesterday it wasn't working because it had a layer of ice on it. So it, we weren't able to see anything because there's too much ice on it, but it is working today. I was just on it earlier today. Can you comment on the cranes that migrate to Monte Vista, Colorado? I don't know much about them. They're a much smaller population, obviously, than the ones that come through here. Like I said, the Midwest or the mid-continent ones are about 80% of the population. Um, you can kind of see they're that yellow population. The Rocky Mountain one are the ones that go to Colorado. So I don't really know too much about them. All right. Any other questions that anyone had before we hop off? Thanks guys for joining us. Hi Allison. I used to work with Allison. <laughs> All right. Thanks everyone. We really do appreciate it. Like I said, if you are able to uh, give us a donation if you can. And we know it's going to be a hard time for everyone right now, especially people who have been laid off recently, but every little bit helps, especially since about a third of our revenue comes through from crane season each year. And because we were only able to do about a week of it, we're really going to lose out on a lot of our revenue this year. So we really do appreciate any and all help you guys can give us. Thanks guys. <laughs>